in my remarks today, not uh, necessarily first addressing the issue at hand, what this Torah means to me. Uh, first, I would like to offer a uh, rebuttal against my Chaver, Balev of Benefesh, David, who's like a brother to me, but after a vicious and unprovoked attack <laughs> yesterday on Gush, I did, which is all I could do to restrain myself from jumping up, and I actually went over to him and said, can I say something now? Can I wait till tomorrow? So I will address a few, I, I must say a few words about yesterday, and to be honest, what I'm going to say right now really is a topic for a debate, uh, as a, and it is a longer discussion, but I, 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 I feel I cannot let it go. I will say a few words about it right now, we can discuss it further, I will debate at some point later on. <coughs> Rabbi David yesterday spoke about him, uh, de de I can't speak English. De de deference? Deference? I, I deference, de deference. deference to all those who preceded us. And um, Rabbi David assumed so both in three different areas that of Tanakh, that of Gemara, Talmud, and that of Halacha. To a certain extent, of course, I agree with Rabbi David. There is no doubt that uh, at the end of the day, we have to have deference and vow to those who are before us. There are many sources for that. Without, of course, taking away from our own responsibility to be creative and to be disciplined and to learn and to, and, and to, um, and to be informed. <coughs> there is a Mishnah for Shehavot, which I like to quote. Your house should be a house for wise men. The but the, the end of that quote, you should, after having a uh, relationship and the importance of creating and having a relationship with wise men, not wise men, the mission includes the Vemitavek Bafar Gehem. Usually people understand this to mean you should sit at the dust with your feet. It could be a shot. I heard from one of my teachers a great shot. The Vemitavek, the word the Avek means to struggle. The word Avak means dust. In Hebrew, to wrestle means. When wrestlers in Hebrew are called me'avkim, because they kick up dust when they wrestle. The Vemit Avek means to kick up dust. Kick up dust with your Rebbe. Kick up dust with your teacher. Don't take anything he says lying down. When you go to discuss something, when you go to ask a question, be prepared. Don't go to ask a question and take second whatever he says for granted. Learn the topic, learn the sukya, whatever it is. Argue with him. I always say that I would prefer someone to be in Apicaris, this is not a joke right now, than in Amaretz. In Amaretz is someone who doesn't know anything. When people say to me, well, I don't really get it, I don't know, so I don't do this, I don't understand that. You're in Amaretz. Be in Apicaris, at least. Which means, be well informed, know, at least, what you're rebelling against. The uh, longer discussion as well, but Ben Gurion had a nephew, who was also called Ben Gurion, who was the uh, director of the library of the Kibbutz movement. And if you know, all the, uh, the first Zionists were all people who came out of the Shiva to Eastern Europe and took off the kippah. But they were all, like the Gurin, Jabotinsky, Chadam, all these people. But they all had a connection to Yiddishkeit. And down the line, Ben Gurin's nephew said, we wanted to raise a generation of Apikarsim, but we raised a generation of Amaratsim. That's because people think they'll know anything. We wanted people to be in Apikarsim. Know something. People don't know. So Bebi Tabek means argue. Kick up the dust. At the end of the day, you have to remember one thing. Bafar at the At the end of the day, their word is final. So argue, kick up dust, fight. Be knowledgeable. Just remember, at the end of the day, his word is final. I agree with this. In the world of Allah. That is to say, you want to ask it, like I said, ask a child in Kashas, in Shabbos. Be informed. As I was spoke about yesterday, Borah, what are Borahs about? Learn all the topics, learn all the Rishonim, learn, learn, learn the halacha. Then ask a question. Argue, discuss. The Rebbe of Sarah at the end of the day is final. In the world of halacha. Not so, I believe, in the world of learning. And here, I understand maybe Rav Ramach to disagree with the world of Tanakh, but I think this is true both in the world of Tanakh and the world of the Rav Ramach to Everybody is familiar with the uh, statement, I think, that when I daven, when I pray, I talk to God. But when I learn Torah, Hashem talks to me. Hashem is talking to me just like He talks to Rashi, like He talks to Rambam. And when I approach a Gemara, and this is what I learned in the whole Yeshiva of Yeshiva Karizion, if I learn a Mishnah, I learn a Gemara, first of all, I want to see what I understand. 
Reading Rashi already colors my vision. Even reading Steinthoff's name, for instance. You know, having a, I'm not saying you shouldn't. Sometimes, you know, I, I, I have no problem per se. So I would judge, but I have no longer problem per se with a person using Steinthoff's name because he needs to, to help himself along. But, but if a person is really trying to learn the healing, <coughs> even Steinthoff's, at the end of the day, it's, it's a, the, the, the punctuation, that's really the commentary. I have to confront the text and understand it and see what it means to me. Then I'll go to the Rishon. I promise you, I've seen this time and time again. If you learn a Gemara, you analyze it. What's the question? What's the answer? The answer is so clear. What was the Makshin asking? So what changed before the question and the answer? And you start coming up with different options. So you ask the question, and you sit down and you really plug at it. You come with a couple of options, you find them in the Rishon. But it's something that you reached on your own. There's no greater Hana or true Emmis learning than that. And I think the same thing with Tanakh. This is a bigger discussion that's been going on in the religious Zionist community for several years now. But here too, if you believe that Tanakh is by Hashem, the Torah is by Hashem Amash, Nevi'im, who is prophecy, Ketubim, Ruach HaKodesh, if you believe that there are messes of ethics and morals that Hashem is telling us, then I have to see, wh what does it mean to me? Again, I'm not Chas Shalom saying you shouldn't learn Radak and Rashi and other commentaries. But first and foremost, what does it mean to me? The greatest heroes in Jewish thought are not those who never sinned. The greatest heroes in Jewish thought are, are, are Jewish law. And in the Tanakh, to be sure, to be, to, 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 uh, the same thing, are those who might have made a mistake, but they need to be true. Read the Tanakh and see what it says. I'm not saying you shouldn't see commentaries. You should see them. But first and foremost, you have to grapple with the text and see what it means to me. So with all due respect, and that has a lot of ramifications, what I just said right now. So with all due respect, but David, I, I think that in the world of learning, what is Allah of course, at the end of the, the final word is the Rebbe's. In the world of learning, I think first it begins, it, it, it must first begin with the creativity and the independence of the lamental love. So that's regarding what was said yesterday. Again, we're, I'm happy to discuss with David this at a later date, but I, 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 I have to say this, and I'll move on now to, uh, no, uh, I was assured that this has not, that come, does not come up on my body many times. <laughs> I don't know what can I do, I have to say. Now I'm getting my body more. <laughs> right, I'll try to show you. Specifically regarding the topic at hand, uh, what does Torah mean to me? So the, the rabbis, that, until this point, have spoken about more specific issues. What does Talmud Torah mean to me? What does Kitanah mean to me? Understanding what the, the true Gdolim are, the importance of my Gemara. I would like today to take a slightly different approach. And today I would like to say that without specifically well, on an address of issues, means to me, I'm thinking Torah as a way of life. Torah is Torah Chaim. How we live. When we wake up in the morning, what are we looking to achieve? Why do I wake up in the morning? Do I have something to wake up in the morning for? Am I living a fulfilled and creative life? Do I have meaning to me? <coughs> to me, that's what Torah is. We speak of someone who's a Ben Torah, and the biggest bracha, of course, I can give to everybody that's at Midrash, is that you grow, and you consider yourself a Ben Torah, and the people view you at the end of the year as someone who's a Ben Torah. But I do not think that a Ben Torah is merely someone who's learned 60, 70 copies of Gemara. That might be a worthy goal. But I think a Ben Torah is someone who lives a life of Torah and everything that he or she does. Recently, today as well in the newspaper, one of the items that has come up that the Israeli Israeli society is going crazy about. At least 12, maybe more than that kids have been arrested already. Kids aged 12 to 14. There's a gang rape that was called in Oka. In the Tel Aviv area. Now I'm not, I am not naive. I know that certain things can affect all segments of the population and all types of society. Recently, a leading religious Zionist rabbi was convicted for certain sexual offenses. 
I'm not saying that just because a person wears a keep I makes them automatically a tzaddik. Nor do I think that if a person is secular, that automatically makes them a bad person without morals or ethics. I don't say that either. And that many people without people on their head are upstanding and very wonderful people. One of them saved my life in a prison mission in the army. And in the army, there were times I wouldn't go and patrol with a guy in a keeper because he could be relied upon. So I, 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 I'm careful here. I do not want to obviously to make generalizations. That will not be, that will not be true. However, if you are asking me, what is the potential? What greater potential? Well, how is it, what, where is the potential for a person to lead a moral and ethical life, to be guided by certain principles, which in this world will enable them to be productive and contributing to society, I think that is a life of Torah. Vaborek and Bomayim, the Gemara Darshan, regarding Yosef HaTadik. The Gemara Darshan said that the pit was empty, that they threw at the Yosef, they threw Yosef into the pit. Moses says it was empty, there was no water in it. The Gemara says, well, if it's empty, of course there's no water in it. Why does the Torah have to emphasize there was no water in it? The Gemara says, Mayim Engel and Hashim Vaparabim Yishbol. There was not water in it, but there were snakes and scorpions. People are not vacuums. People fill the life with something. People usually do not sit around all day doing nothing. And what is it that you do with your time? And if your time is not filled up with mind, it won't be filled with that Hashim and If your life is not filled with something which gives you water or spiritual sustenance, Torah, it will be filled with snakes and scorpions. If a person doesn't have anything to do with his day, he ends up watching seven hours of TV a day. Which they've permeated with sex and violence, and that, that, that's going to be your mindset. I read recently something very interesting. In one of his books, Rabbi Sachs pointed out something very interesting. He said there's a, there's a, very, there's a very famous comment Marx said that religion is the opium of the masses. What does he mean? I mean, well, there's a class of people that some are rich, some are poor. So if you believe in religion, so it just keeps everybody quiet, because that's what God wants it. Open with the masses. But it's like that, you don't understand anything. Religion is the opposite of that. We say three times a day, let's say, Shem Olam the Malchut Shazai, to make this world a better place, to perfect the world. Judaism is there to make this world a better place. Not to say it's okay. If people are poor, then we have to fix that. It's exactly the opposite of what he claims. But he didn't understand. Because he was an artist, which he learned. But Yiddishkeit, we can make an argument of all religion, but Yiddishkeit means I'm going to fix the world. I'm going to wake up in the morning, I'm going to make this world a better place. There's a book called Why the Jews? Solution and Pray wrote it. Just the other day he quoted Pray And it's a very fascinating book, and they discuss the issue of anti why is there anti-Semitism in the world? And they go, they go to different historical periods, and they say, well, it can't be because the Jews are rich, because when they're poor, they can't when they're Jews poor, that's why they're rich. And it can't be when they assimilate, because we're in luck in the ghetto, they hate them. It can't be when they're in the ghetto, because when they assimilate, they hate them, and so on and so forth. These are our just, you could call them the external labush, the clothing, the external uh, reason that they pick on a particular time and place. These are just outside things. What's the real reason? Ethical monotheism. Because Jewish people say we're here to make the world a better place. In the world of paganism, there's always going to be a God who says to do what you want. And in the world of no God, as was famously stated by Russian author, everything is permitted. Because there's no absolute morality, no absolute ethical standard. But if there's one God, then there's a right and wrong way to behave, which is objective. Then who wants to know about that? Because I want to eat what I want to eat, and I want to sleep what I want to sleep with, and I want to have fun. And who's going to tell me what to do? And that's why the world doesn't like the Jews. Because by our very existence, we say there is a moral and right way to act. And here I'd like to point out another thing. Many of us, I think, tend to think around this very, about this very point. People tend to misunderstand halacha. People think that halacha gets in the way of life. They misunderstand halacha. 
They think I want to have life. I want to have fun. Oh, Allah tells me I can't do this and I can't do that. For example, message yesterday. I want to do this. I want to get on the phone and check out what I did. Or check my Gmail. And they think, well, I want to have fun. I want to do stuff. And my asad, Allah gets in the way. That's in the same thing with Allah is. Allah is not out there to forbid. It's out there to the hafir. To say it's okay. The Torah says, I'll give you an example. The Torah says, Look at Rosh Pokemon for the Nabi Allah Shabbat. Do not light fire on Shabbat. So, how do you relate to this Pasuk? You can go to one of two extremes. You can say, I'm not interested. The Torah is not divine. I'm not committed. I'm not interested. Do whatever you want. Or you can take it to the other extreme. The Karai, the Samaritan, and say, I can't have any light. Or anything lit, lit on Shabbat, even if it was begun before Shabbat. So they sit in dark and they eat cold food. That's the other extreme. The Jewish guy says, hang on, this is Rosh Shabbat Pet. Shabbat is, 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 is on it. You're supposed to enjoy Shabbat. Torah, Torah Chaim. So you can't light a fire on Shabbat, but if it's before you can chew out food, you can make a, a cup of tea with the Kri Shlishi. Many ways, people get upset. They just, I want a cup of tea. You're within the framework of what the Torah wants that allows you to do. There's no ideal to be machmir, to be stringent in Allah. The Gemara Masechet Shabbat writes that in the time when the Jewish people returned after the first destruction, so there was tremendous little Shabbat in Yerushalayim. Three different Nehemiahs. And the Gemara writes that Nehemiah had to go to the extreme. And he made everything in the world moksa. I said everything under the sun. Because when you're here, right, Rabbi Nehemiah there. When you want to get to here, where do you go? You got to go to the extreme, and then eventually you get back to the middle. So there, where's tremendous chul Shabbos, and he answered everything under the sun. So the Gemara writes, Chazru veitir, Chazru veitir, Chazru veitir. As Shabbat, as keeping Shabbat became more acceptable, people understood and appreciated. So they let go more and more until they get to the Chazuk that we have today. There's no ideological idea that says you don't have to be machmir. And that's what Allah is all about. But Allah is about living in this world. We want to live in this world. We're not Christians. We don't put an ideal to be on the monk of mountaintop and abstain from everything. What's the ideal? Not to have relations, marriage relations, and not to do this and not to do that. No, Yiddish faith says, we're in this world, enjoy life. Be a light to the nations. But there's a time and place for everything, make things holy. I will try to finish on the first thing. What I'm trying to say is this. Maybe I'll try to sum it up. Yiddishkeit is a puzzle. It's a mosaic. There are many things. There's Talmud Torah, and there's Halacha, and there's Chesed, and there's this mitzvah, and there's that mitzvah. You want a relationship with a Kaddish Baruch Hu, then you have to do what a Kaddish Baruch Hu says. I can't go over to you and say, I want to be your best friend here. I want to show how friendly I am. I'm going to bring you a bowl of steaming asparagus, or broccoli, which you do for if you don't like asparagus, then I've done nothing. People who think they're going to have these spoilers that they're going to sit in a, some religious things and philosophers think they can have a relationship with the divine because they go think about it and philosophize about it. It's not going to work. The Bible says you want a kesher, which is the most natural thing that any human being would want. You want a kesher, you want a place, built into a kesher, with the divine. This is the way to go about it. You have a 5,000 piece puzzle, and you do all the pieces, and you're missing three puzzles and pieces at the end, you're going to go crazy. It's a puzzle, it's a mosaic, and every piece is necessary. We have to try to figure out why. We want it to be meaningful, to be short. But to me, then, Torah is life. Everything that was discussed until now, understanding Pishim Dov, understanding Tefillah, and Tomu Torah, and Lulim, they're all pieces of the puzzle. But to me, Torah is life. To me, Torah is creativity. To me, Torah is productivity. To me, Torah is Olam Hazeh, not Olam Abba. Olam Abba is not mentioned once in the Torah. The Torah is not interested in Olam Abba. Why? Another time. It's interesting, Allah is there. The rewards in the Torah are earthly. So we can make a difference in this world. To me, that's what Torah is. It's a way of life. It's a way of having fulfillment. A way of being creative, of productive, of tikkun olam. And if we understand that this is Torah, that it's a way of life, and understand and appreciate all the pieces of the puzzle, 
then I think that we will all be able to do our bit in Tikkun Olam, and then we will all be able to do our bit in being, or making nations of, of Israel and all our Lavuim like the nations. <laughs> Rabbi's a